Another episode of Leadership Lessons. My guest today is Representative Jason Petrie, and our topic is public policy issues in Kentucky. Uh, Representative Petrie, thank you for joining Leadership Lessons. Oh, thank you for having me. I, I appreciate it. Let me tell you more about uh, about Jason. Jason Petrie has served the 16th District of the Kentucky House since 2017. His district includes Logan, Todd, and part of Christian County. He is co-chair of the very important committee that prepares and submits the state budget. Jason is a Kentucky native. He grew up on a small farm in Clifty, Kentucky. He holds degrees from Berea College, uh, Western Kentucky University, Go Toppers, the Ohio State University College of Law. Uh, Jason returned to Kentucky in 1998 to practice law and in 2007 began his own general private practice. Over the course of his career, Jason's been involved in multiple civic organizations and local boards and is an active member at Dripping Spring Baptist Church in Olmstead, Kentucky on Watermelon Road with his wife and three children. Jeff Knopfsinger is his, is his pastor. That's a lot of information about you, Jason. Let's, let's jump right into these questions. Tell us about your the work that you do as a representative of the 16th District and what made you want to pursue elected office? Well, thank you. Um, As far as what we do, uh, most people, I assume, will have some working knowledge of what a state representative does. But uh, once elected, uh, part of what you're doing is receiving input, constituent issues from various people and entities and what may be pressing in your area, in your district. Uh, And then going and representing those people in Frankfurt when we're in session to make sure that you apply your best judgment on their behalf to uh, address any other issues that may come up. So push your own for your constituents and also make sure that they are apprised as best possible and and uh, use judgment of should a bill move, should a bill not move. And then we do have legislative oversight. So part of what we do. Uh, is not just creating law and and making judgment calls, but also making sure that the policies that are being set forth by the General Assembly, um, there's oversight to make sure those things are being accomplished as well as being accomplished faithfully and and, and correctly. So uh, that's a that's a real quick rendition, but okay. that'll give you an idea. Yeah, and, and then why? I mean, you were you were a practicing attorney. What made you want to run for office and put yourself out there and do all the campaigning, go talk to people, raise money? All those things that, that you have to you have to do. That's a little bit of a, a loaded or a, or a compound question. You're assuming that I wanted to. Okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, what I would simply say is this: that um, uh, I think you would you would acknowledge this. Uh, God provides direction and guidance, and, yep. and sometimes we're not smart enough to follow it. Uh, and if we don't do that, He can make us so uncomfortable that we have but one doorway to go through. And and that was really the beginning of my. Uh, my entry into the legislative arena uh, and so uncomfortable and and felt the pull of uh, and weight of obligation of do what you're supposed to do, make things better, serve other people, uh, that I got to a spot where I had only one option. And, and so I ran for a representative of this district. So Jason, did that come to you through through just an internal sense of, of, a, of a need to uh, get involved in leadership or did people come talk to you? And say so you ought to run for office, or how did you? How did I mean? You sound like a, a heavy sense of conviction and calling. It it was, and this is why I was in practice for a good number of years. I've been a felony prosecutor, been in regular practice, and and I've done well. My community has done well for me, and and um, I like my home, I like my wife, I like my kids, I like my church, I like all the things around, and the practice is good and healthy. Uh, and I also like helping people. So in the legal profession, you can do that all the time, every day. Mm-hmm. Um, people have talked with me about running for an elected position and serving in a role at a state level. Uh, not really something that I wanted to pursue. Uh, and I will say in some senses that was selfish because uh, I liked the work that I was doing and I thought I was doing well by helping others in that capacity. Uh, but there was a conviction laid on me of um, it's time to grow up. It's time to think larger, bigger, and serve in a different way. Um, you could continue serving as an attorney and helping people on day to day, but there were policies brought to light for me, um, directions by the Commonwealth, which were yeah. just not healthy and not God-centered, yeah. and um, and laid on the okay. Uh, if you're not going to, who should? Well, then you get it put to you, well, I'm telling you, so why aren't you? <laughs> yeah. So, Jason, I'm assuming you're like any Christian that's being called 
there came a time when you were just probably hearing it all the time. You'd probably open your Bible to read it, and you'd you'd have a sense from the Lord. A preacher would preach a sermon that had nothing to do with with yep. with you, but you would hear God's voice. Is that is that kind of what was what was happening? It is. There were what I like to say is there were certain verses that I came across in the Bible that just really pinged you between the eyes, and you have no way to get around them except for either to hide or take action. So. Yeah. Thankfully, at this point, I took action. Well, thank you for answering that call. So you mentioned that part of your work is to listen to your constituents, people of the the two and then part of Christian County, three counties that you represent, and then bring their issues to, to Frankfurt when, when appropriate. What are some things you're hearing people say? What What's on the minds of your constituents and, and others? What's kind of bubbling up that people either want to see happen for human flourishing or to see stop happening? Uh, it. Lots of times it's not that complicated. I mean, I hate to say it that way, but it's not. People are people everywhere you go. So, you know, what do you want? You want a you want a life where you can make some money, so you can make a livelihood. You can you can be married. Uh, you can have kids. Uh, they get good education. Uh, you've got some health care. You've got some opportunities available for you, your family, and your kids as they grow up. Um, and you'd like for things to be in the world not upside down. Mm-hmm. So, some common sense on social issues and. Uh, those are not those are not uh, extraordinary expectations, I don't think. But kitchen table issues uh, and common sense, and in my area, uh, somewhat a good rural church type mentality of uh, you just want things to work right. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, just if, if you watch national news and pay attention at all, we know there's a there's a movement in in our nation and our our uh, that's afoot that. Um, LGBTQ plus issues and rights, people's use of pronouns that are maybe inconsistent with their with their biological birth, um, it, and then conscience matters where a person just wants to go do their job, and and yet they have a Christian conviction that that really I, they would just feel uncomfortable crossing that line. Does, is, is that coming up at all? Is that something that's on on your radar? It does some, but of course you have to look at what my constituencies are. Uh, and there is some health care and there's yep. some uh, education folks and uh, those they will express concerns about. Uh, for instance, we had policy come out this last guidance policy that came out of the administration at the state level this last uh, summer uh, that was concerning to several um, and brought to me uh, about how to keep information from parents uh, when a child has gender questions yeah. and they experience dysphoria. Uh, also keeping information from parents, uh, g- generally or generically, and in the healthcare field, uh, what if I'm associated with an abortion, or what if I'm associated with a tran- transgender transitioning type activity, uh, can I say no? I mean, as you know, and, and many people do in Kentucky, uh, there are strong, strong, well-based thoughts and beliefs about those type issues. Yeah. And to put someone in a position where they have to violate their own conscience um, is a very tough thing, and, and, I, and I don't abide that well. Uh, medical marijuana is an issue that's mentioned occasionally. I think we, we saw that a, a, a sports gambling uh, bill is, is trying to make its way again. Jason, as a, as a follower of Jesus, you know, you had to wrestle through these matters. You're, you're trying to read all this law, which I, number one, I can't imagine just the things that you have to read. Uh, what, what guides you when you're trying to think through issues like medical marijuana, like expanded gambling, and uh, knowing that, that gambling, of course, it brings in some revenue, but it's, it's only going to ultimately hurt, hurt people and hurt families. What, what, what guides you in, the, in those decisions? Well, I'm going to tell you, that's a, that's a better question than what you even think it might be. Um, when you're a legislator and come into Frankfurt, uh, you know where you come from and you know what you campaigned on, but a lot of people start thinking more than they are based on their principles. Mm -hmm. Uh, They forget who they are and why they were sent there by their constituents. Constituents don't send you for a particular issue. They send you for your judgment and what you base your judgment on. If you get into a thinking exercise with lobbyists and other legislators and all the interests that show up in the hundreds of peoples and emails you get, you are a ship lost at sea without any direction or without an anchor. Um, You have to know who you are and what your principles are, and not just in the rote sense, but how it relates from from a biblical standpoint all the way to what are the real world effects of violating those principles? Uh, when you get into those conversations, um, 
you won't think your way through it. You may think with your principles and your beliefs, but you better have those beliefs and principles or you'll end up wherever someone else wants you to. So Jason, what's helped form you as a, as a, as a person? So you, I mean, you've grown up in, I mean, you can't really call Logan County West or Todd County West, quite West Kentucky. It's kind of West Kentucky. It's West of part of Kentucky. So what, what's, what's, right. what's helped you, what's formed your convictions on just that, that helps you be anchored when you're away from your home and in, in Frankfurt trying to make these decisions and people are, are lobbying you. I mean, they're, they're urging you to think this way or, or go in this direction. Yeah, I I don't want to I don't want to repeat myself, but I, I'm going to reiterate it though. Yeah. I mean, you know, I was raised uh, I was raised with church going folk, and and I was raised in that type of environment. Um, and as you said in the intro, I went off into philosophy and econ and humanities and and law degree. So there were a lot of people and a lot of old and current thinkers that you're dealing with. You find out who you are, especially as uh, you go to church most every Sunday. You're trying to study the Word, trying to study the principles, trying to learn more and apply that deeply to your life, not just on top. Um, And as you go through the practice of law, you're going to be challenged with, um, we'll shade a little here. We'll shade a little here. Uh, And you're going to have to make that decision early on. No. What's right is right. What's wrong is wrong. And you're going to have to figure out those things. And you're going to have to answer not only to your colleagues and to your constituents or your clients, but you're ultimately going to be answering to God. Uh, And it doesn't matter what the current mode of belief or thought is. You better stay true to where you where you're supposed to be. You take that. You go to Frankfurt. The practice of law was challenging with all the pressures around to do the wrong things for the right and wrong reasons. You get into Frankfurt where there's much intensity and money and pressure from every angle that wants you to go in every different direction. You better have those principles sound and you better be secure in who you are and that you're serving God and serving others because of God. Else you will end up anywhere and everywhere. So, Jason, the few times I've been in, in Frankfurt, um, I have a sense that a lot of the folks there, they, they, they're they coming from great backgrounds, people just like you across the state, and, and they're, they're, they're coming to do a job and serve people. But it's I have a sense there is a lot of pressure on them, and even it's a spiritually challenge, a challenging in, environment. Do you find the environment itself spiritually challenging? And if so, in, in, in what in what ways? It's a, it's extraordinarily challenging, and I have to say it's probably the most extraordinarily uh, challenging environment I've ever been in. I was concerned when I went to college. I was concerned when I went to masters. I was really concerned when I went into the law degree because you got a lot of smart people and smarter than me going in, and and professors that are there that are well versed and they know what they're talking about. Uh, and then going practice of law, but going into Frankfurt is a whole different set of challenges. You walk into an arena that is an echo chamber in and of itself. It's pressurized. You hear all the same things. Uh, Lobbyist constituents that are professional constituencies Mm -hmm. show up and they know how to work and everyone knows how to, well, come eat with us. Mm -hmm. Well, 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 come sit down with us at the front of the table. And then one of the things I just do not like, you know, I am a representative and I serve other people in that capacity. And I, and I have the opportunity to also serve as chair of appropriations and revenue overseeing budget and taxes. Mm -hmm. Those are important functional roles and I give them great respect. However, I do not like being called chair. I do not even like being called representative unless we're talking in an official capacity. Mm -hmm. I don't keep a lot in my office and I don't like going to events. Mm -hmm. Um, and I look at it, what's my functional role while being there? I'm there to serve. Yeah. I don't want people serving me, and I don't want the pressures of me thinking that in some small part or large part it's about me because it is not. And you have to reinforce that all the time because uh, one of the best and easiest ways for someone to angle, persuade, or manipulate is to make that other person feel it's about them and that you're there to make them better and to give them praise for what they're about to do. I don't want any part of that. So, Jason, you represent a constituency, and and you hear from them, I'm sure, occasionally. And um, what's the best way for folks to give feedback if they want to make you know of an issue that that concerns them, in fact, most I think most folks don't know who their representative is. They wouldn't know who to call or or, or how to how to call. How do folks uh, how do folks talk to you? What's feedback that's been helpful uh, for you in your role? 
most any honest feedback or honestly felt feedback has been helpful. Sometimes it'll be by telephone calls and we'll get back in contact. So lots of times it's by email. I don't get to re respond to all of them. Um, don't think there's any way possible to, if yeah. you had any idea how many I receive in a day. Uh, but the fee, I actually read those things. I read them myself just so I can keep receiving input to make sure that um, I'm acting with as much accuracy and as much input as possible. Other legislators do the same thing. Lobbyists provide a certain amount of information, but it's for a particular purpose. Um, I really like it when we get feedback from constituents, whether it be in a town hall or email or see me in the grocery store or the post office or whatever. People, I'm sorry, I don't mean to bother them. Like, it is not bother. Right. I like I like knowing what's on your mind. How am I sure. supposed to know if you don't talk? But the one thing I would caution is this. Uh, there's feedback of, hey, I, I, I'm praying for you. Uh, there's feedback of, uh, I know that y'all did this. I, I like that. And there's feedback of, uh, I'm just going to grumble about whatever I want to grumble about. Yeah. Now, all of that feedback is helpful, uh, but just one all the time of any one of those is probably not the best. So a, a good good dose of each of those is, is more helpful. That's 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 interesting. Jason, your time in office so far, what's something that you've been part of that you're um, – proud is probably not the right word, but it's, it's the one I use that you're most proud of or most pleased to be, be part of? You, you know, one of the uh, – as a process matter, I'm very – I'm very um, happy with the fact that the General Assembly since 17 has turned more into a working functional body that's there to represent people. Yeah. I wasn't there prior to that, but I understood there were a lot of theatrics and a lot of wasted time. And, mm -hmm. and I know what policies were there because we're cleaning up a lot of those things. But I think we're a much more practical policy issue oriented and trying to make things better for Kentuckians. Um, I, I'll, I'll stop there on that one. Okay. So I, I know that there was um, a, a bill, I think, last week to do something about lowering taxes in Kentucky. Anything else that has started or that's making its way out that's public that you can talk about in terms of uh, coming coming bills or, or law that may be passed? Yeah. Um, of course, we took up some, some continuation on tax reform. Uh, we made sure the Veterans Center in Bowling Green was yeah. funded and, and those type of things. Don't know that there's any hot button issue that's uh, pressing in a committee or been assigned to a committee, but I would anticipate there will be several things that come up this session. Even though it's a short session, we've reminded everyone, short session means cleanup and modification, not new programs and policies. But at some point in time, there will be a hot issue that comes up. But regardless, um, I still anticipate that there would likely be uh, a bill or bills on what we normally call help not harm uh, so that uh, children experiencing gender dysphoria are not um, physically or surgically altered or chemically altered in a permanent way or even semi-permanent way um, for what I would consider probably wrong reasons, especially at that age. I would also anticipate that and I hope that we have a, a parental rights bill come through. And these are, you know, I'm, we're hitting these really quick, so there's a lot sure. of detail to them, but parental rights in the sense of making sure that uh, we understand uh, the state does not own nor parent the child. Right. It's the parent that does that, and the parent has not only the authority but the responsibility to do that. They need to have information when they're in an educational setting or when they're in a health setting that should not be withheld from them in either sense, and that schools and health um, systems, they work for the parent at the parent's direction for the benefit of the parent's child. If we can get into those issues, and then I would anticipate uh, – We've had this come several sessions recently, uh, sports gambling, mm -hmm. um, uh, marijuana for medicinal purposes. Um, I expect those to come up again, although on the medicinal purposes side, I think the House may wait on the Senate to take action this particular session because it has passed the House previously. And the sports gambling may be the same way. Uh, the House has passed that previously, but the Senate's not taken that up. So I would expect those to be uh, expected topics of discussion and probably bill bill consideration. Jason, thank you for especially those two issues: the the help not harm um, legislation and then parental rights. You know, any previous generation, your 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 parents, grandparents, hearing that we're even having this conversation, would have thought, "What on earth are you talking about? That this is a matter 
and, and yet it is the day that we live in. So thank you for trying to hold back that tide that, that um, pushes against a biblical worldview and, 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 and I think even pushes against common sense. But thank you for your efforts there. Hey, let's talk about leadership a little bit. So you're in a leadership position and you um, chair, co-chair, work with others who are in, in your similar role. Uh, what, what are some lessons you've learned about trying to lead leaders? It's a tough one. Okay. Um, leading leaders in the in a corporate world or a private world uh, has its difficulties. When you get into the legislature with other elected officials, uh, personalities somewhat get larger, experiences get larger. Um, what I would say, though, what I've learned more than anything else is is are these two things. Uh, one, you're not going to do it all by yourself. You're not going to lead just by yourself. You're not going to accomplish and push legislation by yourself. It always takes others. And in order to involve those others, the best way to do it is to keep this mindset. Uh, You are there to serve others, develop them, work with them, discuss with them, and make them supported in any way you can to make sure that we're pushing good progress, good policy, that God will be pleased both in not only the substance but in how you do it and how you do it with other people. If you can keep that in mind, I don't know that you could go wrong. So you're saying you're saying lead leaders by serving them and then yes. doing what you do in a way that honors the honors the Lord. You're glorifying God personally in the way you carry it out. What are some pitfalls? That, I mean, you've been doing this long enough. You've bound to made a mistake or two somewhere along the way. What are some pitfalls that, that you've seen that either you or you could say someone that you knew got in trouble trying to lead a group of leaders to accomplish something? I, I will stick with what someone else, others have done. It's easier for me to look at them. Yeah, right. Uh, don't don't let your personality get so large that you think you're right or you know you're right uh, without um, the room for listening. Yeah. Uh, even someone who comes from ill intent or, or from a completely adverse position from your own. Uh, you can always learn something from someone else, regardless of whether they agree or disagree with you. You can learn more about your own position, about their concerns. Uh, don't ever shut that off. That's something I see people do like, this is just what we're going to do and, and we're going to push. Well, that's not good policy and that's not serving the Lord and serving the others appropriately. Uh, you've got to always listen. You've got to always work with people. This is a persuasive game. Uh, this is not a force game. Uh, politics can be brutal, hmm. uh, but policy shouldn't be. It should be thoughtful, meaningful, methodical. Um, and ultimately, if you're serving others, uh, both constituents, but you're serving and helping develop and supporting those around you, uh, this is a long game. It's not just session to session. It's a long game. I've, I've reminded people, even in my own position, like we started something when I came into judiciary chair uh, a term ago. And then uh, appropriations and revenue, this this most recent last term, I made sure my vice chairs were as involved as I was, as much as they wanted to be. Every meeting I set, every call I took, they were involved in it and all the good and bad and in between. And and I said, look, one day I'm not going to be here, whether mm-hmm. it's by choice or whether I'm removed or whether I die, um, whether it's planned or not. I want someone else and others Mm-hmm. to be ready to take up those same policies and keep pushing and know what the pitfalls are and what the goals are. The more people you can get in line with understanding and yeah. thinking and understanding those policies and principles, uh, when I leave, those things will continue on. Yeah. I will cease my influence, but those policies and principles will continue, not only in the legislature, but how it ripples through our commonwealth. Well, you're mentoring another leader when you do that, or other leaders when you're including them in the conversation. You're you're also getting their feedback. They're going to hear things different than you're going to hear them, and 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 notice some things that you're not noticing. Jason, you mentioned two things I think are really important, worth talking about more. You mentioned persuasion in trying to get folks on on your your page. This has to do with church leadership. You also mentioned a long game, and it's more than just this temporary win right now. So talk a little bit about persuasion. Uh, what have you what have you what have you learned about being a persuasive person? And maybe how could that help? You know, I work with pastors, and pastors have to lead. They have to lead folks that may not be on board with their vision, and they may believe their vision is is from the Lord. So. What could you say to us about persuasion and that notion of playing the long game? 
Well, the persuasion part, it can be taken multiple ways, but the two easy ways, you're persuading for the right reason yep. in the right way or, or in the wrong. So persuading, manipulating, persuading rhetorically, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about persuading as in discussion and having those hard conversations, those difficult conversations about what principles you're acting on and how that relates to the Word of God and how it relates to the real world and the effects of those things. Uh, that's the persuasion, and what I call it is, poli is, is policy, not politics. But once you start engaging me in policy, I'm going to start talking principles and how those principles apply to the issue and how they apply to the facts. And the long game is this. I, I, I believe, and I can't do otherwise at this point, that um, the ends do not justify the means. Mm -hmm. uh, the means and the ends should be one and the same. And as long as we're keeping that long game intact of, I am but an instrument, a disciple, and that I'm here to serve others. And you work on policy with that mindset. That is a long game. If you get frustrated by the moment, uh, why can't we get this done now? Why can't I persuade that person? Or you get frustrated by the session. Why couldn't we have gotten that done? Okay. I would ask you, and I'd put it straight to you as I've done others, is the focus on what you're getting done or is it what you're doing for others? You know, it, it, is it the frustration because you're not having your will in your way mm -hmm. or is the frustration that God's will is not being done? Well, let me tell you what, God's will will be done. Mm. You need a long game in mind. Stick with the principles, stick with the procedures, stick with doing it the right way for the right reasons and the right end. It will work. Jason, you mentioned principles several times. I assume there's some principles that kind of guide you in your in your thinking. So I want to ask you two questions moving toward toward closing. One is, uh, who is somebody that's been kind of a role model for you in leadership, either elected office or not elected office? And then has there been an experience in your life that kind of shaped how you view the role of, of leadership? I may blend those together, but okay. I will say, you know, I had the benefit, and I'm looking at it now, I really had the benefit of uh, studying philosophy and humanities and, and going through law school. I continue to look for the principles and everything. And um, I've thought with some great, great people from history, uh, yeah. thought with them and they've led and that's been great. And some certain legislators I've had, I've learned things from them, but, but, but for today's discussion, I would really point to two people that mean a lot to me right now, historical figures. Uh, from a legislative perspective, and 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 they're uh, somewhat very different. Uh, one is Edmund Burke, back from the 1700s. Uh, the other is uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, when you look at their context, very different. Uh, their times were very different, and their roles were even a little different, but both tried to serve. They believed in virtue as a prerequisite to liberty and to our type of government. They believed that serving others uh, not serving yourself was a prerequisite to that, and it was the only way to get things done the right way. Uh, there are a lot of commonalities in the in the you know, flow of thought and the principles that they operated on. You know, I give you all kinds of good quotes. I, I love hitting hitting the two of them a lot. But you know, one of the great ones from Martin Luther King Jr. is is everyone. I won't get this verbatim right, but everyone can be great. Anyone who serves is great. That's the way you become great. Yeah. And Edmund Burke on the legislative side, one of the things I like to point out of recent to uh, some of our new members, and I'm going to paraphrase this rather than use his words. When you come in, before I do that, when you come into the legislature, a lot of one of the things that we hear is, well, now I got 60 calls against that bill. I, I've got to vote my constituents, or I got six calls against that bill. Right. I've got to vote my constituents. If you're going to vote your constituents, and that's the way you're making your calls on the House vote, then go home. Yeah. Uh, because we can do that by calculator or by, or by an app of some sort. Uh, so Edmund Burke said something like this. A representative who substitutes his judgment for the opinions of his constituents do neither himself nor his constituents any justice. It's that judgment and that's when I go back to those principles and people know who you are and how you are and how you operate and what things you believe in. That's what they send you to represent them for, not on a particular issue, nor to tabulate votes from calls or emails. Um, those two people, uh, as I work my way through time at the, at the General Assembly, I have become more and more important and seem more and more apropos to uh, what we do all the time. 
Jason, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for serving in your, your current role. Thank you for your involvement at, at Dripping Spring Baptist Church, loving your pastor and shouting yep. out an amen to him every now and then and encourage him when he preaches a good sermon. And and um, if there's ever a need to say something challenging, I'm sure you're willing to do that as, as well. But thank you for joining Leadership Lessons. If folks want to reach out to you, what's the easiest way to get a hold of you? Uh, anyone can go to the Legislative Research Commission, LRC in Kentucky. You put that in and, and it'll pull you to it. Legislators, and it has our emails, has telephone numbers, or you can hunt us down locally. Or you can always contact a pastor. They can normally find me also. <laughs> Jason, thank you for your friendship and thank you for, for serving in, in the way the Lord's called you. Thank you. And, and thank you for what all y'all do. It's uh, It's very beneficial to the Commonwealth. Thank you.